Welcome to my Commodore 64 Games of Memories. This is where I look at old games and some of the technical details behind them. Let's get into it. Today we have Creatures, published in 1990 by Thalamus, coded by John Rowlands and graphics by Steve Rowlands. I think the cover artwork was by Oliver Frey. This was developed by Apex. Apex are John and Steve Rowlands. Rowlands? 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 Rowlands. I'm not too sure. I'm sorry, John and Steve, if I'm getting your name wrong. Anyway, so I remember getting this game very early on when I was but a teenager, I think. And I think I had the disc version. So I was really intrigued by this disc turbo loader back in the day because it had really interesting border effects. So I looked more deeply into it and found that it was doing a 2-bit protocol transfer. So that's what we'll do at the moment. We'll have a look at the code and we'll see if we can identify where it is. So this is, uh, immediately we can see here that the Commodore 64 side of the code is doing some kind of handshake across the serial line here because we can see the store accumulator and then load accumulator with DD00 in hex. That branch on plus just waits for the handshake to come back from the drive. It then does this four stage lookup into that table at 600 and 608, 610 and 618, which is a fairly standard way of including uh, a lookup table to translate the serial bits into actual bits with that nice little offset table. Uh, we can see this kind of code and pattern commonly used because it's probably the most optimal way or one of the most optimal ways of decoding drive bits. Hello cat. My cat's just come to say hello. Hello Mimi. Yeah. She's also looking at the drive code as well. Anyway, so let's just update the notes in the debugging text file, and I'll be committing this debugging text file to source control. Let's also have a quick little look at the disk to see if there's any hidden files on there that we can recover using my updated version of C1541 tool, which includes some of this kind of like analysis tooling to help you find out what's hidden inside disk images, especially G64 files, but D64 files too. I mostly updated this tool to help me analyze GCR data when I was working on uh, my own 2-bit drive transfer protocol and also working on protection stuff. But then I realized, of course, that, you know, uh, disk based software is not that common on the Commodore 64 anymore, to be honest. It's getting harder and harder to actually source 1541 disks. So hidden on the drive, slightly hidden, we can see that there is this what looks like unencrypted, because I could read the text, uh, data on the disk. This just looks like a copy of the game data that's loaded, but the game data is also referenced, or a version of the game data is also referenced uh, in the boot menu. So I don't think we'll spend too much time looking at that. We'll just have a look at the drive side code that runs when the Commodore 64 is receiving that serial data. And what I'll do is that I'll just put the breakpoint on the Commodore 64 code where it starts retrieving the serial data by reading it into the wire register and then loading the accumulator with that translation table at 600 in hex in the Commodore 64 side. And we can see that if I just do a little step for one instruction, then we can see immediately where the drive code at 756 in the drive's memory, we can see, it, see it's doing a, a logical shift, a few logical shifts and then a store and then some more logical shifts and anding, and then a store, and then a TXA and store. So basically the drive is sending two bits at a time and the Commodore 64 is decoding two bits at a time. So let's update the debugging text file notes with the information found so far. 
so you can review it later on if you like and I'll put the link in the video description for this. So once the load finishes we are greeted by this nice little fading Thalamus logo and then this nice colourful creatures logo with this character set with the raster bar effect behind it nice little scrolling message and the uh, excellent very distinctive musical style of Steve there I really enjoyed listening to the music demo as well I think it was on a different disc it wasn't on, on this version of the disc uh, the, the Thalamus Presents uh, text that was on the previous screen is actually sprites we can see those sprites being loaded there uh, luckily the word thalamus is eight characters wide so we can have eight sprites so obviously there's a little bit of sprite multiplexing going on uh, probably almost certainly not flexible multiplexing but just updating the sprite registers twice as it goes down the screen the thalamus logo itself uses uh, a character set. It looks like at this point in the menu, even though it hasn't shown the loading screen yet, it's got the loading screen already and waiting in memory. There it is. That's the character screen there for the for the first level loading screen. So it's just prepared in memory but not currently being displayed, which is cool. Conceive this so we've got we can see the text message, but we can also see there that there are two character sets. So if I exit the debugger and then the Thalamus logo fades out, we can see that one of those character sets is going to get destroyed. And there we go. And it fades back in again, actually, but it doesn't need to get faded back in again because uh, the Thalamus logo has already disappeared. But I, yeah, I don't think that it contains the uh, character set for the other characters and stuff because the, the character set there is actually later on in, in the graphics map memory. Anyway, so the game loads now and then after most of the game data has loaded it refreshes the loading screen again and then we see this message. So this loading screen data in the top right hand corner of the debug text screen window there actually gets loaded twice or refreshed twice uh, the little uh, loading bar there uses a self-modified character for that pixel accurate loading bar we can see that it gets updated in the graphics character set map there we can see that this is a standard multicolor text screen I do like this this loading screen with the with the little map of how the levels are put together. I'm not going to play all of the levels. What I really want to do is that I really wanted to look into a couple of the graphical effects on the title screen and also I wanted to really cover in a little bit more detail today how the game screen is horizontally scrolling because it's very unusual and it's actually using a technique which is uh, on some Commodore 64s a bit unreliable. So I don't know if you noticed, but when the high score table was scrolling up, the screen that was being shown in the uh, debug graphics map was actually stationary. So we'll go into a little bit of detail about how that's done, but we can also see here that the creatures logo is comprised of sprites and it's using some multiplexing as well for the sprites. Again, probably not general purpose multiplexer, but just updating the sprite registers at least twice. I think three times because the sprite registers will also need to get updated for those clouds in the background, which are sprites. Now, there is an Uncle Clyde file on there as well, which is just the loading screen. I think, is it the loading screen? It's just a nice little bitmap, actually, a nice colourful bitmap. Clyde needs your help. Uh, I don't remember rightly at, at the moment if that was on the tape loader or not. Hmm, I might check that out later on. Anyway, 
Uh, there's the menu file and the game file, which you can load. And we can see in the debug graphics map that it's just basically loaded all of this data again. But, and actually the, the character set data is duplicated there. It's all uncompressed. It's not encrypted, encrypted at all. It's just that you need to find the right start address. Uh, also, probably the disk loader is not going to be in memory, so it might not be able to load the second part. The disk loader, I think, is, is put into disk memory quite early on in the boot process, you see. And it would make sense to not really need to re refresh it. There is that self-modifying uh, animated character for the loading bar. I'm just going to save a snapshot here at this point if I want to get back here quickly later on. Okay, so into the game. Now this is where the horizontal scroll for the game gets really interesting. We've got some lovely music here. We've got the option to turn the music on or off. So I don't know if you noticed, but when the game screen was horizontally scrolling on, the debug characters there in the debug graphics view, and you can rewind the video to have a look at that, they weren't scrolling left to right. There was just like a wipe effect going from left to right, but the actual character screens themselves weren't scrolling. We can see a double buffered screen here, but again, the double buffering for the screen is actually not completely double. Buffered. I mean, the, the screens are double buffered, but they're not using double buffering in the in the usual sense. The two screens, if you notice, are offset vertically rather than horizontally. Why is the second screen vertically scrolled up one character compared to the screen in the top right, or the first screen? And we can see here, if I push the screen horizontally, there is a vertical split. So what is going on here? This is not the usual way of scrolling the screen because the usual way of scrolling the screen is that you shift the characters to the left each time you want to scroll a character with. And you use the hardware scrolling for uh, the eight pixels for the pixel level scroll, right? So something really weird and unusual is being used for this scrolling effect. The game is nice and colourful. I did really like how colourful the game graphics are in this version. But if I use the uh, screen editing tool, we can see that actually it's not using uh, the second buffer for the screen currently. It's not rendering that at all. It's actually rendering uh, the first screen at this point. And I can test that by, by editing it with the with the debug characters there. So if I connect, say for example, that platform, I can edit the characters and I can connect this platform with the top of the hill just by doing that. So you can see pretty easily which screen buffer is being used. So if I continue to scroll across, we can see that even though the game screen has scrolled more than a character, it's not flipping to the other screen yet. It's not rendering the other screen. I died. Oops. Let's go back and demonstrate that again. This time, let's hopefully kill uh, uh, the enemies so I don't get distracted and killed by them. So why is... So one screen is vertically offset by one character, and even though it's scrolling more than the character's width, it's not flipping to the other screen in, in the usual way of doing a double buffer screen update, which is on a per character basis as it scrolls horizontally. It's maintaining the same screen visibility across multiple character scrolls. And the graphics map is showing that there is no character scrolling data, or character scrolling of the data, rather, as the screen scrolls vertically. There's just this weird vertical split. Now, 
I was really intrigued about this effect uh, back in the day when I was very young. It was really hard to understand how this smooth scroll was going on. And now look, you see, once the vertical split has traversed the whole width of the screens, then it flips to the other character screen buffer. Because we saw that, because the visible screen on the Commodore 64 suddenly got rid of that platform that I was being that I was using for stand to, to stand on. Right, because that platform that I edited in the debug graphics view, I was standing on it. So Oh, now I'm gonna lie again on time yeah, because that was just Okay. I'm spending most of my time looking at the debug graphics view rather than actually looking at the game. Whoops. So again, I have to find which uh, current screen bank is being rendered to edit it so I can cheat over here and hop up and then go back again. But I think we need to uh, start debugging the code to really understand how this screen is horizontally scrolling. The funny thing is, is that I've blocked myself in now so I can't progress through the level, but what I can do is that I can also edit the screen so I can remove the block that was blocking me and I can walk through it and then it suddenly reappears when it starts rendering the other screen buffer again. So we know that the game is using the currently rendered screen for collision information, which is useful to know, right? Uh, if I block myself in with with solid blocks, then I can't move through them, so the game collision detection is definitely using the visible screen for collision detection. It's not not looking at any kind of like compressed map data or anything else like that stored elsewhere in memory. I love how the score panel for this game is actually using a large number of expanded sprites. The score panel is really uh, rich and uh, colourful and well animated and it certainly uh, helps to make this game stand out in terms of its display complexity. But I think what we need to do now is that we need to go into C64 Debug GUI and have a much closer look at this scrolling that we can see uh, in the game and also I think we'll have a look at that um, vertical scroll for the score panel as well at the same time. Oh, whoops, I have my old Hunter's Moon uh, cartridge connected. Hold on a second, I need to detach everything first. There we go. So let's load uh, the game and see what we can find. When the Thalamus Presents logo comes on, we can very quickly see where those red boxes are highlighting where the sprites are. Sprites up there and sprites down there. The creatures logo is bouncing up and down even though in the debug view it's not. And basically the same effect is going to be used for that score table that also smoothly scrolls up. Now if anyone, or if you're watching and you're familiar with how demos quickly move the screen around, you probably have already guessed how the logo, the score table, is being smoothly scrolled and if you are a little bit more advanced then you will also probably have guessed already how the game screen is horizontally scrolling. But we'll go into this in more technical detail. So we can immediately see that the creature's logo is definitely sprites. Uh, we can also see that there are these little animals down at the bottom that get flattened, which are also sprites. The creature's logo at the top, sprites, the clouds, also sprites, and then the creature's logo at the bottom is a duplicate of the same sprites, just with different colour information by the looks of it. Okay, so this is intriguing. Look. There's that effect again where the screen data doesn't actually scroll characters, but the screen is smoothly scrolling up. So we can pause that in the debugger and then have a look at what the code is running that actually produces that effect. So let's pause that. There we go. The screen has 
halfway scrolled up. So if we have a look at the top character lines, we can see very quickly using the code debug view on the left hand side. If I move the raster down, we can see that it's doing this repeated effect here. It's doing this repeated code. So it's loading accumulate with D012, which is the raster position. It's extracting the Y scroll for the raster position. It is then EORing it with a specific value. Uh, I think it's enabling the screen and also um, twiddling the Y scroll values and then storing it into D011. D011 is the VIC register for the screen enable and screen Y scroll and other fields as well, but basically it's the Y scroll which is important. So every single raster position where it wants to introduce a blank line is it's basically reading the raster position and then scrolling the screen down so that the VIC chip will not start rendering characters. It basically opens a blank idle line and we can see here that the sequencer state in the debug view up at the top there is although it's in standard text mode and it's meant to be visible on the screen the sequencer state is in idle mode and this is because the vic chip is every line being told that it needs to scroll the screen down one pixel or four pixels or three pixels or whatever basically the vic chip will miss the timing where it needs to start rendering text rows and it will always then be in this idle state and it will insert blank lines. We can see that by enabling the bad line view and we can see where the VIC is displaying its bad lines. It only begins to dis start to display bad lines further down the screen. And this is where the score panel data starts to scroll into the visible area of the screen. So this is called um, an FLD basically at like a flexible line difference. This is where you're basically causing the VIC to have a flexible line distance. You are basically inserting blank idle lines that we can see there in the debugger. We're inserting blank idle lines, which basically shifts the entire screen down. If you do this effect for the whole, or if you do this code for the whole screen, then the whole screen will be scrolled off to the bottom. But if you only do it for half the screen time, or if you do it in the middle of the screen, for example, then you'll be adding these flexible line, uh, flexible idle lines at the portion of the screen where you want it to, vertically speaking, and then you'll just open these lines. So it's a very uh, easy way, relatively easy way. I mean, the timing is quite tight, but not incredibly tight. Uh, you don't have to be very accurate, but you have to be somewhat accurate to be able to insert these blank lines. Um, actually, you know, it's an effect which uh, you can sometimes see used in games. So um, in uh, Tusari, for example, uh, in one of the levels, the horizontally scrolling levels, I use several of these uh, blank flexible line insertions to scroll portions of the screen vertically at different speeds. So I have vertical parallax scrolling in those levels uh, with horizontal scrolling as well. So uh, the, you can use this effect in game, but the thing is that you, you start inserting um, blank character lines. And, and so you feel as a game designer that you want to fill these blank character lines with something. Anyway, so it's a difficult effect to use, basically. So anyway, let's have a look at the game horizontal scroll now. So the game horizontal scroll is what sets apart this game from other games. It's an effect which is very rarely used uh, because actually it does introduce some unstable uh, memory timings, which affects certain Commodore 64s. Not all of them. That's why the game got published, but it does impact some Commodore 64s. We can see actually that the multicolors get changed as I move the debug cursor up and down. We can see that the multicolors get changed sometimes at several positions down the screen. You can see there, right? The, the colors go from that pinky, orangey, brown color to the gray, 
yellow uh, color palette. And that's what makes the game screen look nice and colorful. You know, when I first got this game, I thought that it was scrolling the bitmap screen. It was so colorful. And I think that's the effect that the game programmers wanted. But actually, it's just character screens. Anyway, so if I scroll the, uh, the debug crosshair up and down, we can see for this, for certain pixel positions, it's running very time sensitive code. Let me find where the code is. Hold on a second. So here we go. This is this this whole string of no ops that's being executed with an RTS at the end of it is a very good hint about what kind of effect is being used. So if I scroll to the right on a pixel, on a, on a character basis, on a cycle basis, we can see what instructions are being executed. This long string of no op instructions basically helps to precisely time when this update code starts updating uh, the VIC registers to cause this horizontal screen position code to actually run. We can see where the bad lines are. So the trick here is to precisely time the update of a store into D011 twice, but with two different values. In this case, two different Y scroll values. The two different Y scroll values that we saw in the debug view there are, what is it, 1B and 1.2. It preloads those two values into two different registers and then it does the store consecutively. Now this store has to be precisely timed to adjust the horizontal scroll position and we'll have a look at that in a second. But these bits that are being set and cleared are really important for causing this effect. So you'll notice that the sequencer state is in uh, display mode in the debug view there. We can see that it is also toggling the bit for uh, 25 rows while also updating the lower three bits. In other words, uh, actually it's updating the lowest bit, zero bit, which alters the Y scroll uh, position as well. What this effect does is that it precisely times the update to D0, to D011 to cause the VIC chip to start processing a bad line condition where it basically uh, freezes the processor and starts reading in extra uh, character data for the row that it wants to uh, start displaying but because you're triggering this position in the middle of a scan line at a particular cycle position it causes the VIC chip to start trying to fetch character data from memory at a different time to when it usually should do and this causes the VIC chip to fetch a, a fewer number of characters for a character row and then it reaches the end of the, the raster line schedule for how it uh, times the update for each raster line. And it pulls in a, a fewer number of characters for this line, depending on the timing of the horizontal update for that D00, what, D011 register. And what this does is that it causes a horizontal shift of the number of bytes for the character screen. So every single character row that is then read in by the VIC chip is also shifted horizontally by this incorrect number of bytes because the an internal counter hasn't been um, updated correctly with you know 40 characters it's only updated 20 characters or 15 or 10 characters and this causes the horizontal screen offset to be shifted for all of the character rows going down the screen this means that by precise, precisely timing those updates you're able to shift the entire screen between 0 and 39 characters. And because the whole screen is 40 characters wide, you can shift the screen at any position horizontally just by doing these few instructions at the 
precisely the right time. I will uh, be linking uh, a Vic article which describes this technical detail more comprehensively so you can read about it but basically you have to time this routine extremely sensitively at this position on the screen. Uh, you can do it in a couple of different ways you can Y scroll it you can enable or disable the screen for example but basically you have to make sure that you do it at a position to, that causes the Vic chip to start processing a bad line. That's the trick. Now the way to get this routine to trigger at a particular position has to be um, cycle accurate. So that's what all of those no ops do. That's what this little routine here does, where it loads the, loads the accumulator with D012, which is the rest position, and compares it with 30. It basically, and then it is a branch on equal to the next instruction. Branch on equal will take an extra cycle if it's successful and it will skip a cycle if it's uh, not successful so basically it will take two or three cycles and this combined with the two cycle no op list basically allows this code to precisely time to a cycle level when the updates to d011 happen and this code is actually very similar to uh, some demonstration code which i have and it's actually in source control as well that shows you this effect in isolation so it's actually easier to understand and look at and i know some people have taken that code and used it in their own projects as well so let's have a look at that code oh while i'm trying to find that code um let's just double check this so when i have put the crosshair for the debug cycle view there um, at that position on the screen and then I scroll the screen you can see that the code on the left updates so that kind of tells you that the update store to D011 happens at uh, different times depending on the horizontal screen scroll there even though the crosshair hasn't moved the timing of the store to D001 D011 has changed so that kind of like shows you that that's how the code works, is that it's based on the precise timing of the store to D011. If I scroll the screen even further, then the timing of that update code uh, changes. So there, the store happens uh, much at a, at a much different position compared to where it was before actually on the screen. Now there is one problem with this technique and that's that it's unreliable on some Commodore 64s. So this DMA delay technique affects the timing of the DRAM chips, which are the RAM chips used in the Commodore 64. That's because the VIC chip is uh, at least partially responsible for uh, generating the DRAM chip uh, request and refresh timing signals. So when those signals are disrupted on some Commodore 64s due to timing differences, uh, the DRAM chips are refreshed incorrectly and that causes corruption in the memory and then eventually, uh, actually quite quickly sometimes, the game code will crash because the Commodore 64 has corrupted code in its memory. And this is why on some Commodore 64s this game would not work and it's a technique that is not commonly found in games probably because of that. So here we are, I found uh, the link to the old code uh, that I posted on Codebase64 a long time ago now. But basically this code demonstrates uh, the effect that I know it as as HSP, other people know it as a DMA delay code. Uh, some people call it VSP for variable screen position or something like that. Anyway, the, the code is looks very similar, right? There's this whole, there's a whole series of no ops for the initial timing and then delay for the final timing. And then there's that pixel wobble check, which is what the creature's code was doing as well to precisely time the pixel cycle timing 
there's more delaying going on here. Uh, and then here, what it does is that it uses a um, branch into uh, the final two cycle delay table here, which allows the horizontal scroll position to then jump into a variable variable position into that no op table and then we have basically the same kind of code it enables the screen it then does an increment and then well it does a decrement an increment and then it does a store to enable the screen but basically it's it's twiddling the same kind of bits it's it's twiddling the uh, screen y scroll position uh, let's see if I can get that, find that code on my hard drive and actually uh, get that running so you can see the demo working with that code. One moment, please. So here is the uh, raster test 2 code. Uh, actually, this code includes, um, well, it's AGSP code, which is any given screen position code, which basically uh, marries the HSP code with a line crunch which and the line crunch allows the the screen to be scrolled quickly vertically um, I'm just trying to remember how it was assembled oh yeah that's right so that's the old raster test code let's go into the right directory and no that's the old it's this different demo sorry uh, let's go into there and then go into here and then let's assemble the correct source file this time. Okay, raster test two. And then if I run raster test PRG file, then that will be that. There we go. So the the little white line up here is where the border color is updated to show that the next block of code is precisely timed at a cycle level resolution. So that's the increment and decrement for the border color there. That just shows that the code is stable. Stable in terms of where the code is executed on the screen at a particular cycle and timing. Okay. Uh, this is called stable, basically raster based um, code. There's no flickering or wobbling of, of the cycle timing. It has to be precisely accurate. So as the, as the white debug border update moves, depending on the horizontal screen position scrolling, then the next D011 update also changes. And we can see here that I'm scrolling the screen vertically as well, and, and that's because the screen is horizontally and vertically scrolling using these VIC scrolling register update tricks along with the line crunch. The line crunch goes on in this black area up at the top of the screen. So this black area up at the top of the screen is used to crunch uh, character screen rows. And what this does is that it causes the VIC to then force extra character rows to be fetched on each um, raster line. And then that causes the whole character screen to be scrolled up by eight, eight pixels or a character row very quickly. But basically this code is a distillation uh, of the of the AGSP routine. So if I comment out now the, the vertical scroll update, the line crunch, if I comment out the line crunch, then basically it's just leaving the horizontal screen position code, the HSP code here, which as you can see, if I move it left and right with the joystick control, then it enables the whole screen to be scrolled left and right. So you can use this code because I'll link it in the video description. You can uh, use this code, read it, understand it, and use it in your own projects as well. So I think we'll leave this video there. That's basically what I wanted to cover in this game is how it uses a couple of different, at the time, quite unusual demo effects, but these days they're very well-known effects uh, for vertical and horizontal scrolling of uh, the high score table in the game. If you like these kind of uh, retro Commodore 64 technical deep dives and memory 
videos then please do consider liking or subscribing to this channel and if you really really like the content then a super thanks is also very much appreciated it really helps with funding this work that i do especially the electronics work so thank you very much for watching take care have a great day wherever you are